So, happy Sabbath. Now, by the title of today's message, some people may automatically just tune out. Don't, okay? Because it's not just about married people or people who are getting married, right? God bless you, but still, right? This is a this is a message that's made for married, unmarried, you know, divorced, young adult, teens. Everybody at one point will have those decisions to make, but everybody in the household of God this should ring um, something familiar with, right? Because throughout the scriptures, right, from the beginning of creation, we learn that God created marriage. And when he took the first woman out of the first man, right, that's the only time that ever happened. And from then on, all uh, you know, males would come from the female and said, but in this case, the uh, woman was taken out of the side of the man. And throughout the scriptures, we find that marriage is a theme. Hosea, in chapter 2, verses uh, 19 and 20, we see, I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness, in judgment, in loving kindness, and in mercies. Thank you. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness. And you shall know the Lord. Other examples you can read in Jeremiah and Ezekiel also similar, right? The marriage theme runs throughout the Bible into the New Testament. Jesus's parables liken the kingdom of God to a marriage feast, right? That a king threw for his son to a guest without a wedding garment. And there's even mention of a bridal chamber. There's the guests of the bridegroom, the 10 virgins waiting for the wedding banquet. And the church is likened to a virgin espoused to Christ. So how significant is it, right? That even the last pages of the Bible being written that the subject once again turns to the marriage supper of the lamb. So yes, the wedding banquet, this has to do with all of us in one way or another. For your notes, Revelation 19, uh, 6 through 9. That being said, we're talking about marriage between a man and a woman as well today. If I can get this slide to turn. I want to ask, what's the purpose of marriage? Right? And usually when this question is asked, you get a lot of um, responses that will be like, well, because he or she makes me happy or because I want to be happy, or I'm lonely, to make God the offspring, right? Procreation is a scriptural point, but I'm going to be fruitful and multiply, but I don't think it's the main point, right? Loneliness is a scriptural point. It's not good for men to be alone. But Paul also said it was good to be wholly devoted to the Lord and be single. So some might say it's cheaper to be married, two sharing the chores and the expenses. Right? Tax breaks for doing so. But the purpose of marriage is not to make you happy. Sorry, guys. Typically, um, and my wife and I did first did this message in the form of a uh, seminar, uh, a marriage seminar at a feast. And uh, it was well received. So we, I turned it into a message that, that we could share with everyone this way. And uh, the point though, is if you strive for happiness, you're gonna fail. Because life isn't all sunshines and rainbows, you know? God's glory is why two people get married. God's glory is why any of you remain single and devote yourself to the Lord. If you're devoted to the Lord, it's for God's glory. And that's awesome. And that's what he designed it for. So the why behind the what? I've heard it said here. Usually I have an animation, but our current recording system doesn't allow that. So I, I have an animation here that I'll, uh, I'll just do out here. So it says that man and woman, or husband and wife are like two similar pieces to a puzzle, but they're also very different. 
And when those pieces fail to come together right, you don't get to see the beauty of what marriage is all about. But when a husband and wife do come together, they glorify God. But if they fail to come together or fail to come together in the love and peace that God created them to come together in, they'd give a distorted image of who you worship. So it's very important because people are watching it, right? They want to see, you know, hey, how is, how is having you know, Yahweh in your life make you different? Are you the same? But if you claim to be a follower of Messiah, you have to remember people are watching, right? If you don't have a harmonious relationship with your spouse, then people are asking, is that, is that all Yahweh can do for a marriage? Why bother? If you're any no different than the people who are unchurched, quote unquote. When I say marriage is not for your happiness, you know, don't get me wrong, you know, because you might say, what, God doesn't want me to be happy? Sure he does. But if you make, you make it your primary goal to be happy, you will not, if you reach that goal, you will not sustain that goal, okay? Because if you truly want to enjoy long-lasting happiness, you have to make it your objective to make God happy. Right? This was the essence of Christ's teaching in Matthew 16, 25, right? For whoever so, so whosoever will save his life will lose it, and whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Happiness will be elusive to you if you seek happiness first. A couple of quotes from some uh, mainstream evangelists. Adrian Rogers uh, once said, happiness is something you stumble over on the way to serving Jesus. And when you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ, happiness is the byproduct of righteousness. And Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, seek for happiness and you will never find it. Seek righteousness and you will discover you are happy. And it will be there without your knowing it, without your seeking it. God wants you to be holy. He blessed marriage and he wants marriage full of holiness too. If we seek to walk holy, in our relationships, all of them, not just uh, husband and wife, we seek to walk holy in our relationships before God. Rather than pursuing happiness, you will realize both. So, of course, you know I have to go to the scripture at some point today. So let's let's hit this one. It's it's vital that couples or anybody who's a follower of Messiah, make God's goal their goal. Not my will be done, but your will be done, right? And this is very true in the marital relationship. When he's reading Genesis 127, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We're made in his image because he wants us to be like him. Does the father ever treat his bride in a negative way, a, a way that doesn't express his love and undying faithfulness? You know the answer. Our purpose is to bring glory to heaven, to the father and to the son. Revelation 4.11, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you have created all things, and for your pleasure they were, are, and were created. That's each of you. If you don't know, why am I here? There it is. You were created for his pleasure. And he does get great enjoyment when he sees his children walking in the way. Isaiah 43, 21, for this people I have formed for myself that they shall show forth my praise. Don't mistake what our purpose is. And marriage is no different. Again, in Isaiah 43, up in verse 7, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for 
my glory. I formed him. Yeah, I made him. This isn't about you. In the Psalms, we read, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto your name give glory for your mercy and for your truth's sake. There are countless scriptures that point us to give God all the glory. 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether you eat, you drink, or whatsoever you do, stay single, be married, whatever. You know, hang out with your mates, do whatever. All for the glory of God. And that's something we can all learn from. I, I'm not putting myself above that, right? We all need to learn that everything we do should bring him glory. Marriage is less about finding happiness as much as it is, it is about displaying God's power and his love so it glorifies him. He gives us glory to return that glory to him. Husbands and wives who make happiness their goal are always seeking gratification. And during stressful times, they always have less strength and less focus to help them endure through the valleys of life that are present in everyone's life. It's not always blue skies and butterflies, right? We know that. It'd be foolish to think that. When times get tough, and they will, couples can often fail to see any chance at happiness, and then they become disillusioned and discouraged about their marriage. And when those turbulent times come upon them, and they will come, they have no vision to follow after, nothing positive to focus on. The scriptures teach us in Proverbs 29, 18, where there's no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Our righteousness makes a difference. Walking holy before the Lord makes a difference. And when you make him happy by walking in his way, you will be happy. And that won't be contingent on a spouse if you are married or seeking to be so. Now that we understand that our primary purpose is not finding happiness, but rather glorifying God, then things, the paradigm of our life shifts drastically, right? And now for those people who may have a troubled marriage, who hear this message, you know, they can share a goal that can be reached on a daily basis. I can't make you happy, but I can walk in holiness and righteousness and make him happy, no matter what comes at me from the other person or the world. It's in your control. It's in true of each individual, regardless, again, how the other person in the marriage is acting. If they're not walking in godliness, but you are, you're being pleasing to God. If they're acting in carnality, no matter what you say, how they behave, or how they treat you, you can still consistently, every day, reach your goal of bringing glory to God by being holy and walking in holiness. Right? Your spouse may be able to control a, a number of things, but they're unable to control your obedience to God. And if they can, then something else is your God. They can't keep you from experiencing or obtaining spiritual joy. When you glorify the Lord through your actions, your thoughts, and your deeds, you may even win the other spouse over by setting the example with your chaste and godly behavior. I have a note here you know, about Paul and Silas in prison. What in sunshine rainbows for them? They're in a dank, cold, wet, dark prison. In prison, not for doing wrong, for righteousness sake. It was a sad place, a lonely place. And yet they were able to sing with joy to the Lord. And we have to walk that way through the valleys of our relationships as well. Serving the Lord, no matter what happens, right? Don't worry about what they can do to the body. Psalm 1, 1 and 2, blessed or happy is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't listen to people who aren't, 
that don't have Christ dwelling in them. Don't. Why? Nor stands in the way of sinners. That means you, you're not blocking sinners. You don't walk the way they walk. You're not you go walking in their way. Nor sit in the seat of the scornful. A lot of people have scorn and they shouldn't for others. But you're happy when your delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, you do meditate day and night. And therefore you walk in it. Again, you think of Joseph in prison for something he did not do. And yet he still followed the Lord with his whole heart and was blessed for it. He brought God glory. I like this verse in Luke. The only thing that it talks about is uh, his mom, blessed are the, the paps that, that suckled you. And he says, no, yea, rather, are blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. If any of you want to be blessed, no matter what your status, hear the word of God and keep it. By your faith, the best you know how. Honestly, the secret to finding happiness in a marriage is to find it through Messiah. Some people feel out of control when it comes to their marriage. They feel like the other person holds their happiness hostage, right? Using weapons of sin and selfishness. But you got to realize only God should be able to wield that much power over your life and your emotions, right? The real obstacle to emotional freedom is that nobody but ourselves has control of that. Um, if you want a picture, picture a doorway, right? And you're on one side and you can't get out, right? Because you're in, you're in the door of unhappiness and discontentment. But the way to get out of that isn't somebody to come unlock it from the other side. The lock's on your side. And all you can do is unlock it and walk through. It's in your control to decide to walk through that. And realize marriage will not make you happy. If you're not already happy, you won't be happy in marrying for sure. Right? It's not two halves of a whole. It's two holes coming into one. Happy singles do make happy uh, married couples. But if you're unhappy and unfulfilled before marriage, unless something changes inside of you, you're going to fall short of enjoying a happy marriage and probably uh, cause some troubles for your spouse as well. But the promises of God for your holiness, happiness, contentment, never hinge upon your spouse's obedience or disobedience. The promises of God can bring happiness and joy only rely on your own faith and in the faithfulness of God. And he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And if you think you fall short and you've done something that you feel is improper, I mean, it's a short distance between your knees and the floor right, to repent and return to him. And you have to remember he is loving and forgiving. And think of all the stuff he's already forgave you. Don't listen to the devil's voice will come in and say, oh, you don't, you're not really repentant. You're not really doing that. You walk in faith towards him. Walk towards his light. Romans 8, starting in verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but walk after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit mind the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded or fleshly minded, worldly minded, is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. But the carnal, fleshly, physical, or worldly mind is enmity against God. It's his enemy. And therefore, it's not subject to the law of God. And neither can be. Because they that are in the flesh cannot please God. When we allow his spirit to lead us, then we are pleasing in his sight. And we'll end up modeling the behavior that the scriptures tell us to model for all others to see and appreciate and to come to know him through us and our actions. Matthew 7. The house upon the rock. And you know this 
If we build our house upon Christ, the rock, that house will stand no matter what comes against it. But if you build it on seeking your own happiness or your own pleasure, the hedonism of this world, you will find moments that you think are joy, but your life will crash and you won't be fulfilled and you won't be fulfilling what God has planned for you. When you walk in your way, instead of Yahweh's, you're in the wrong way. You're going the wrong way. That's what a U-turn is, right? A repentance, turn around. If you can't be content in singleness, you won't be content in marriage. I've seen it happen personally. And I've seen the, the, the utter destruction that can become of it from somebody who's discontent trying to enter a marriage because they they bring that discontentment right into it, right? Contentment, contentment only comes from the Father, comes from heaven. And the sooner we start seeking him, the better off, of course, we are. But a godly single person who answers God's calling in their life while single, they're not waiting for marriage to make them happy. They already know their purpose to make God happy to walk in holiness before him. Like he told Abraham, be holy. Walk before me, be you perfect. Now, good thing is he's not, you know, grading you on being 100% right because we all fail there. And the scriptures are clear about that. Be a person who wants to get into the kingdom more than anything else. That. Make him the apple of your eye. And then marry someone who also wants their primary goal to get into the kingdom more than anything else, to be pleasing to the Father and the Son. And if you find that, you can walk that path together. Can two walk together lest they you know, be in agreement? You have to agree on that starting point and where you're going. Because you can be at the same starting point, but if your destinations are different, you're going to grow apart. I got a lot to cover, but I trust it won't be boring because it's God's word. Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. Uh, I got the strongs down there for uh, Iser, which is the Hebrew word for help meet. Okay. And a lot of folks... Uh, individuals and sometimes whole congregational churches use this as a place to put a woman in a low subservient helper only role type thing right but I want to show you some exciting things from scripture about this word okay here's this word again in the red each of these times our soul is waiting for the Lord he is our help meet the same word is he a lowly subservient position? Only because he takes it in humility. Our symbol of foot washing teaches us that to serve one another. He comes serving just like Christ did, right? Psalm 70, verse 5, same thing. Lord, you are my help, right? Psalm 115, right? He, the Lord, is their help. It's the same word, Isaac, help me. Happy is he that has the God of Jacob for his help. He's the help me. That's exciting. And it kind of puts things more into perspective. But we'll talk about headship in a little bit. That's another story, too. So here that we have written this from Matthew Henry. Uh, even though it's uh, written long ago, he's got a great commentary. Right? Remember, remember that. God is your easier too, right? He is your hand. Tell me. Are there any questions on that? Okay, good. So here we read, the woman was made out of a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to top him, nor out of his feet to be trampled on by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be loved by him. And that's a beautiful poetic way to write this. But men and women are equal in salvation. There's neither male nor female, you know. Bond or free, Jew or Gentile, 
all one in Christ Jesus. Marriage is a picture of that oneness as well. Matthew 19, starting verse 3, the Pharisees came to him also, come to Christ, tempting him, saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said to them, have you not read that he that made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain, too, shall be one flesh. Wherefore, there are no more twain or two, but one flesh. Where, therefore, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. A Christ-centered marriage is based on commitment. Christ's teaching on marriage went back to the beginning. He always returns back to the beginning. You know, from the beginning, I tell you, it was not so. The word cleave means to adhere to or literally be glued to, right? Stuck on you like glue. This glue is commitment. There's no problem in marriage too great to overcome if two people are truly committed to the Lord and to each other. Have you ever seen the movie Fireproof, right, Kirk Cameron? If you're not familiar with their firefighters and they're talking about marriage and uh, the one firefighter has a salt and pepper shaker and he glues them together. Super glue. So they're, they're together. And he says, if you try and tear them asunder, break them, you're going to either damage one or both of them. They need to stay together to be functional. And I, I that, was a great illustration and uh, the writers of that really um, set that picture up about you can't tear that apart so you got to be sure of what you're doing when you enter these commitments you know you can't hastily say a vow before the lord because he's going to hold us to our words just like we hold them to his i read about uh, some a little side thing I, I read about some parents who were entertaining guests and they received a phone call from their recently married daughter. And after several minutes on the phone, the mother was on the phone with her and she asked the father to come over and pick up the extension because the newlyweds had their first big fight, right? But after a few minutes, the father rejoined the company that he had and they said, hey, what, what, what's going on? What happened? He said, well, she said she wanted to go home. I was like, what'd you tell her? I told her she was home. Don't give, don't give bad advice to people who are in trouble. Don't give ungodly advice. God never wants the solution to be to, to tear those that salt and pepper shaker apart. You're destroying lives and you're not bringing glory to God. Continuing in Matthew 19. But they say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and put her away? And he said unto them, Moses, because the hardness of your hearts allowed you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication and marry another, is committing adultery. And whoso is marrying her, which is put away, is also committing adultery. Fornication, don't take that as an out of your marriage either, right? Adultery is one of the Ten Commandments, and in the, the Holy of Holies, those Ten Commandments were in the ark, right? They were in the ark, but the mercy seat was over. All of those, including that. Fornication and adultery can be forgiven if your heart is willing to. Because of the hardness of your heart, he allowed it. Some people will go, oh, that, there is my out, and stop trying. Be true to your vows. Stick with it. Seek to please God, and you'll be surprised what he can do in a marriage. Seek holiness. If you both are seeking that narrow path, you won't fall into the ditch and pull the other one with you. And he continues, Matt, his disciples said unto him, if that be the case of the man, so with his wife, it's not good to marry. But he said to them, hey, all men can't receive the saying, save them to who it's given. For there are some who are eunuchs who were so born from their mother's womb, and there's some eunuchs who were made eunuchs 
of men. And there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Avoid the counsel of the ungodly. If you're having problems in your marriage, go to somebody whose marriage is good and that they're in Christ. Seek advice there, not from ungodly people, not from single people. I mean, I guess the, a single Christian believer who's walking in holiness, judge them by the fruits, and then you'll know. This was also from Fireproof, right? The wife goes with her ungodly friends and they all start ganging up on that, that man. Oh, yeah, you deserve better. Don't listen to ungodly counsel. And maybe you're only listening because that's what your heart wants to hear because you're setting your heart on other things than God, holiness, and your marital vow. People don't fall in love because they want to, right? God says in the Old Testament, I placed my love on you. I chose you. It wasn't a feeling. It's a commitment. It's a choice. And just, you do have feelings when you first fall in love, right? But it's not love potion number nine doing it. It's not Cupid's arrow doing it, right? And that feeling is because, one, you don't know each other all that well just yet. But you're willing to learn about each other. Your spouse, your future spouse, in that case, you like how they made you feel. It's true, right? But that's why a lot of people fall into that trap, thinking that's what I'll chase to make me happy. Right? But you created those romantic feelings. Always remember that because if you feel they're waning or dying, you can bring them back. Like I said, that locks on the inside of the door. This has to be in every marriage uh, sermon as well, right? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's a powerful verse. Husbands, are you willing to give up everything, including your life? Whatever it would hurt you at your expense for your spouse should be. That's how Christ did it for us. We weren't good. He died for the ungodly. While we were yet enemies, he brought us to himself, sacrificed himself for us. That's the way we need to treat our wives. And I'm not saying that it's always easy because the flesh and the spirit are fighting against each other. And they will all our days. But the more you exercise the, your faith and walk in the spirit, the stronger that becomes. That story, you know, uh, the Indian grandfather, you know, explaining to the uh, his grandson, uh, there's two wolves living inside you, one good, one bad, one really evil, one really good. And they're fighting all the time. And the grandson says, well, which one wins? And the grandfather says, the one I feed. Right. It's, it's all about, are you going to walk in the flesh and feed the flesh? Or are you going to walk in the spirit and feed the spirit? Colossians 3, 18, 19, wives, submit to your husbands, your own husbands, as it's fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. There's no gridlock, no stalemate with God, no tie game. If a husband and wife have talked things out, but can't come to an agreement upon a matter, and they have to walk in the same way, they can't just walk separate in this case, whatever it may be. The Bible teaches the husband's authority will prevail, but he will be held accountable for that decision. By divine design, God has entrusted to the husband that role of leadership and authority in those things. But he has to behave wisely and lovingly to rule his household. The husband's not guaranteed to give you the smartest decisions. Believe me, I know but God does expect him to exercise leadership in the home and to have, he has the power to break that veto, that tie. And a wife submits willingly, like the church submits under Christ. And if it fails, they'll pick up the pieces together for better or for worse.
This doesn't give the husband a right to act arrogant or flaunt their authority. And I've seen people do it who claim to be um, in submission to Messiah and they're not. They can't run roughshod over their family members or their wife. They have to consider their feelings. Feelings are real, they're God-given emotions. You don't base your doctrine on them, but you do consider them when you're dealing with people. Human relationships are our most difficult part of walking this life and walking out our faith. It's easy to read the Bible and say, I'll do this, I'll do that. Yes, Lord, I'll praise you and sing to you and all that. But you know what? Your relationship with God is only as good as your worst relationship on earth. Because if you can't love man who you do see, God says his own word that you don't love him. Says you have to love your enemy even. So takes away the excuses of, but he, but she, love him. You were Christ's enemy. Your actions put him on the cross, so to speak. Love them. Be forgiving to them. A husband has no right to exasperate his wife or his children because he's the head. Now, it's difficult, like I said, when a husband and wife aren't in sync. But if they're both following God, they're both going to end up in the same spot. Husbands, you do have the responsibility, the brunt of the responsibility, and you don't do it alone. You do have a help me, both in God and in your spouse. But it's your responsibility for family growth and harmony. And since you're entrusted with leadership, you're the one chiefly responsible for leading the family towards what? Towards Christ-likeness. Right. Right. That's your goal. Men, if you are married or seeking to be, you follow Christ and you lead your family to them, to him as well. Then you're fulfilling your role as husband and father. Submit to one another. That's a voluntary yielding in love because you trust them, just like we submit to Christ, because we trust him. A wife, that's how our wife submits. So husbands, now your accountability is to be trustworthy and be, in, uh, be humble, right? A lowly spirit. Let's read Ephesians in the record. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit your own selves to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. <laughs> Ominous, huh? No, it's not. Not if you're both seeking that same goal, the kingdom. And that's a great responsibility. Believe me, God will not hold a man um, blameless who doesn't wield that properly. We'll hold our place here. We'll come back to Ephesians, but let's um, pop over here to 1 Corinthians 11. But I would have, you know, the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. There's a headship all the way. These are roles. Again, this isn't, uh, you know, an equality issue. Christ says, he, you know, describing him, he didn't count himself robbery to be considered equal with God, right? He came forth God. In the beginning was the word, word was with God and the word was God. All things were made by him. But he is subservient to the father. He took that position, right? That's his role. And that's the roles of husband and husband and wife and salvation are equal. Co-heirs. Joint heirs. But in the headship role, that, that, so you, this is, really needs some understanding. Men, so you know your role. Women, so you know your role in your marriage. And if you haven't been fulfilling them, Again, short distance between your knees and the ground to repent and return to him. Apologize to your spouse if that's needed and walk together. Commit to walk together again towards him. Walk in holiness and that'll bring your happiness. All right, back into Ephesians. 
Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Why? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The key word love in Ephesians 20, uh, 5, 25 through 33 appears six times. That's a lesson that we need to learn. The marriage bond between a husband and wife, illustrated by Christ and his church, is based in love. And it's a supreme responsibility of Christian husbands in regard to their wives to love them with the same unreserved, selfless, sacrificial love that Christ did for his church. And husbands and wives must both remember that love is a commandment, not an uncontrollable action. Love the Lord with all your heart. Love your neighbors yourself. It's not based on, oh, I don't have that feeling. I don't. I'm not making fun of feelings. God created feelings. They're for a reason. If you use them in a godly, holy way, the way they were intended, they will steer you in the right way. Love that is long-suffering, patient, kind, not envious or jealous, haughty, not boastful, not proud, not easily irritated, not quarreling in front of the children, which undermines the children's feeling of security. Following the Lord will create a happy atmosphere in your home. Love's the standard. You notice Paul doesn't say, be the head over your wife. He says, love your wives. Your role is already given as, as to be the, the head of the household. But love your wives. And husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. I think about Christ giving himself up for his bride. Wow. You know, I think back to the, I think to the back of the book and where it says the bride has made herself ready. Right? That's pretty cool, right? You know, making sure she's dressed in that white linen of the saints, if you will. You know? But here, Christ, we didn't do anything. We didn't make ourselves ready. He came for us and died for us while we were yet sinners. What a great example of the love, mercy, forgiveness, and humility that we should have being made in his image. I think of the end uh, before, his, before his crucifixion in the Garden of Gethsemane. And this has been on my mind a lot. Um, his prayer for unity. You know, Father, let them be one as we are one. And that's the same thing we say from his word about marriage. To be one as Christ and the Father are one. To be one as Christ and the church are to be, supposed to be. He always fulfills his part. He's faithful. Now about us fulfilling our part, I'm thankful that he's merciful. So remember that. Hold your, all your relationships with a degree of tender, loving kindness and mercy. All right, verse 28. So ought men ought to love their wives even as their own bodies. He that is loving his wife is loving himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherishes it even as the Lord, the church. For we're members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones, Right? Is commanded again, right? Using the analogy of Christ's love for the church, that we are to have that kind of love. I mean, it's really explicit, front cover to back cover of this book, right? And, and I hope you all see that. And I hope you can see the marriage theme that's throughout it. Continuing, he writes to the Ephesians, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, right? Quoting the Torah. And shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. 
This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, everyone who in particular had love his own wife, even as himself, and his wife see that she reverence her husband. It's a two-way street, but your spouse's disobedience does not give you the right to also be disobedient. Two wrongs do not make a right. First Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, that they also without the word might be won by the conversation or conduct of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation or conduct coupled with fear of the Lord. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning or plating of the hair or wearing of gold or putting on apparel. But let it be that hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which in the sight of God is of great price. For after that same manner, in old time, the holy women also who trust in God adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. The amazement uh, word there is alarm. Not amazement. Don't, don't be alarmed. Don't be afraid. There's six things submission is not based on 1 Peter here, uh, verses 1 through 6. Submission does not mean agreeing with everything your husband says. You have your own mind. God gave it to you, and you have a right to speak it. Submission does not mean leaving your brains or your will at the wedding altar. Do bring them with. Submission does not mean avoiding every effort to change your husband's mind or to help your husband be more godly as he should help you be more godly. Submission does not mean putting the will of the husband before the will of Christ. Submission does not mean a wife gets her personal spiritual strength through her husband. Submission does not mean that a wife is to act out of fear. That's the kind of love and submission that should be in a marriage. One last uh, part of 1 Peter 3. Likewise, husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. You are to protect and care for and remember that she is your equal in salvation. Why? So your prayers don't be hindered. Why? Because your sin separates you from God and you would be sinning if you're not walking in that way. And finally, be you all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, and be courteous. Always be considerate of your spouse's feelings and show them love and courtesy and understanding, right? That's not always true, but usually a wife would be physically weaker, lots of times um, more emotionally charged. I won't say weaker because they're often stronger in their emotions. And that can flip-flop. It's a generalization, so don't go, I don't agree with that. Right? It's just a generalization. But we have to make allowances for one for another, right? Wives are not inferior to their husbands and should never be treated as such. Wives share the same spiritual privileges as their husband in life, becoming uh, new spirit beings created, and they'll... They won't be together anymore. There's no marriage in, in the kingdom of heaven. You're neither married nor given in marriage. But you'll stand, you'll stand all together, again, with all of us, all of our brethren, which is a beautiful picture as well. But if you don't regard your husbands, if you don't regard your wives the way that First Peter tells us to, your, your prayers will be hindered. And sometimes um, prayer life can, can have its difficulties. I mean, if you're a praying person, you know that sometimes it's hard to to make that connection is never based on him and his faithfulness. It's, you know, his ears not hear, hard of hearing, nor his arms too short to say. But it's our, it's our own as we walk through this journey. Um, that, that's one reason it's good to, to have a spouse, to help walk through that journey with. But you also, again, have to be following the rules of the rule book. And any misery you have is not is because you stepped away from the rules of the rule book. 
Apart from us becoming spiritually mature, living in Christ likeness in our relationships, we're not being all he wants us to be. If you're not being walking, trying to strive to be like Messiah all the time, you're not walking as he wants you to be. And we can know and relate to God by living holy and righteous, living in close fellowship with each other and with him, right? Otherwise, there's nothing, right? I can do all things, but if I don't have love, I'm nothing. Here's that first John 4 20 verse I alerted to alluded to earlier, right? Think about that in your relationships. I love you, God. Really? What about Fred? Well, oh, I can't stand that guy. First John 4 20. Think about it. Love your enemies. Yes. We were that enemy, right? As you have been forgiven, you need to forgive. Remember that. And it applies to everyone and not just married people. These apply to husband and wife. I won't read all these scriptures, but for your notes, if you take them, right? Do not murder, right? If you are angry with your spouse without cause, <coughs> Christ says that's murder in Matthew 5, verse 21 through 25. He says it in general with any one of us, but it applies to husband and wife too. Sometimes we like to look at the loving, kind, gentle scriptures in us relation to other people or to strangers, and then we treat the people closest to us the worst. That's not his way. And we need to repent of it and walk in the right way. We're supposed to have a soft answer. Not a harsh answer. We're supposed to be kind, not a jerk. And guard your anger. Be slow to anger. Right? Have righteous indignation, righteous anger, not selfish anger. And be willing to take a hit for your spouse. That's, that's what you got to do. And there's a holy happiness to doing that. Knowing that you're pleasing the Lord, even though you're taking the hit. Like that, Joseph going to prison and so forth. And we always read, don't be bitter. Yeah, but they did. Yeah. What if Christ pulls out the, but you did list? Think about it. Got to keep your mind pure. <laughs> Lots of times people will point that just to the young men. I, I, it's pointed to everyone. Keep your minds pure. And learn to flee. It says flee fornication. Right? Tell you what. <clears throat> we live in a time with TV, internet, that sin is so close to you now compared to when you lived out maybe on the prairie miles away from everyone else and you didn't have those types of communication the evil still comes out comes out of your own heart but boy when you start to see all that stuff come around you it affects you your environment can change you or you can change your environment and i don't mean sometimes it's flee leave other times it's be the light and shine in their darkness but we're told not to be overcome by darkness. And lots of times that's what happens. You, you walk into a crowd of unconverted people and you seek to be the light. Lots of times they extinguish the light you have. And then they, you know, it's a mockery to Christ. And we bring shame to the name. Don't bite that bait. Porn, unclean thoughts, adulteries, fornications, keep your mind pure. Don't bite that bait because there's a hook in it every time. All right? And it won't make you happy, ultimately. But if you seek to be holy, you won't be, you won't end up on the end of the devil's fishing pole. Married people who are Considering divorce, don't. But God divorced Israel. 
but he also said he hates divorce. Which one are you going to believe? Or how about you believe both? He hates divorce. He gives opportunity for return. He gave the one exception for, for pornea, fornication. But remember your vows to stay together, richer for, for poor, better for worse, whatever else you may include in, in vows. Your first vow is to him. Be childlike in your faithfulness. Remember, God hates divorce. For your notes, uh, Malachi, I want to point out Malachi 2.14. Avoid deception. Don't lie. Maintain your integrity. You can have honesty with tact, too. You don't have to be blunt and hurt everybody. I'm more of a blunt person lots of times, and I have to learn sometimes to temper that uh, steel with you know the cold water, cool it down a little bit. Maintain your integrity. Stand up and be the man God called you to be, regardless of what comes at you, be it in your marriage or outside your marriage. For your notes, uh, I put in Psalm 15. The whole psalm is just, I mean, who's going to dwell on your holy hill, right? You, he who walks uprightly, who works righteousness, who speaks the truth. He doesn't lie. He doesn't backbite. He doesn't, you know, take up an issue against his neighbor. He honors those that fear the Lord, right? He's not putting, you know, he's not, trying to rip people off. He's, he's not taking reward from innocent people. And it says he that do these does these things will not be moved because you're standing on the rock. You're standing on the foundation that you need to stand on. Avoid deception. Avoid retaliation. But she did this to me. Well, what did you do to Christ again? Were your sins pleasing to him? What did he forgive you? Did your spouse, wife, or husband do anything worse to you than you did to Christ? Forgive as you have been forgiven. And it's not impossible in Christ. He separates our sins from us as far as the East is from the West. We can do the same in him. You can't do it of your own flesh. And if you have thoughts opposite of that, it's because you're thinking with the flesh. But we're not supposed to be of the flesh, even though we're in the flesh. We're supposed to lead with the spirit. Don't allow a vindictive attitude to take over. As a matter of fact, that Romans 12 verse tells us to live peaceably with everyone, with all men. And don't avenge yourselves. How much more in your marriage should you do these same things? He said lots of times we'll apply it to other people. But then at home, it's like, oh, nobody sees me. Oh, yeah, you're very visible. Avoid conditional love. You set your love on them unconditionally and you walk in your vow. You walk in faith and faithfulness. And we're told that throughout these countless scriptures. Don't say one thing to somebody and then act differently. Don't give advice one way in a, a somebody else's marriage and act differently in your own. Let love be without hypocrisy. Avoid materialism, guys. And it's so easy to get caught up in having these misplaced values, right? Put worldliness in its place, right? Money can't buy you love. It doesn't. It doesn't buy a home. The price of a soul is worth more than all. Now, a lot of relationship issues end up around materialism, end up over finances and money. Don't let that happen to you. Don't let it happen. You're worth more than many sparrows. You're worth more than many shekels. Don't, don't let that happen. Your spouse is worth more and your allegiance to Christ is worth much more. Avoid petty criticisms. Man, we do that a lot, right? Sometimes you can catch yourself, other times you don't. But it shouldn't be. And it only happens because we're walking in the flesh. The Spirit is probably already telling you, you didn't, you shouldn't have done that. But sometimes you miss. Okay, that's a human experience, but it's not an excuse. 
and it doesn't allow you to continue to do it. We're told to be holy and be perfect. Walk in those ways. And it's not impossible. You know what? It's impossible for you if you don't have Christ in you. But with the Spirit in you, you can be holy and righteous and walk right. Will you ever commit sin if you're following the Spirit? Well, maybe a different spirit, but not his spirit. You'll never commit sin if you're walking in the Spirit. And we're told to walk in the Spirit. So if you're saying, well, I always sin, well, what does that tell you you're walking in? Your flesh, not the Spirit. And it's not impossible to walk in the Spirit. You must endure like a, a soldier. Put your body, like Paul said about you know a, a fighter analogy, put yourself into subjection. Put your body into subjection to him and to your conscience that the Holy Spirit's talking to. Set a watch, O oh Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Right? Out of the mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart. The heart is the problem. You can't change it, but he can. You got to keep allowing him to work. The potter's still working with you. He didn't just form you in his image and left you. He's working on you, on your character, if you let him, if you let him lead. And being that he is collectively our husband, we are to be obedient to him in all things. Apply the golden rule, right? Treat your companion well, like you would like them to treat you, right? Be careful, little mouth, what you say. Treat them with the same love, honor, and respect that you would. They're made in Christ's image. How would you treat him? Don't treat your spouse any different. Don't worship them. Put everything in, the, in its place, right? Build upon the right foundation which means don't commit murder with your thoughts or your tongue. And if you're honest with yourself, you've done it. Anger without cause, harsh words, they're likened to murder. And that seven verses are on there for you, right? Don't commit adultery. Don't even let it entertain it in your mind. It's not acceptable. Does God accept spiritual adultery? Nah, I only worshiped under that green tree three times. It's okay. Well, the fourth time didn't count because I only did it because my friends did it. Right? Don't let your mind be fooled. You take the bait of Satan, he's going to catch you every time. Don't. Be unblemished and innocent. And the only way to do that is to, to not listen to the flesh and the voice of the enemy chiming in your ear. Listen to the Holy Spirit. And if it speaks not according to this word, it ain't the Spirit. Avoid any deception with each other. Right? Don't retaliate. Avoid conditional love. This is your foundation. Avoid materialism. Avoid petty criticisms. And practice the golden rule. These are important foundations. I want to close up over the next few slides with what... Uh, my wife and I called the three C's, right? Christ, commitment, and communication. Combining these three C's will cause any marriage to be blessed and highly favored, right? One of the most beloved hymns um, is blessed be the tie that binds, right? A lot of people sing it at the end of feasts, right? And what it is, is Christ, that word just, that word means the anointed one, the Messiah, right? Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Any way you slice it, God's holy son, who was born into this world with the purpose of taking on the sins of the entire world. And he is that 
invisible force, if you will, in every Christian marriage that completes the marriage to make them one. He is that uniting factor, that catalyst. A personal relationship with Christ keeps your marriage up in one accord with Christ as the head. And the more we focus on God, the more married couples will draw closer to each other. And I refer to that uh, triangle diagram that's on the next slide too. So I'll pull that back up here, right? If you're here and your spouse is here and Christ is here, he's only in one spot. If you both seek Christ, guess what? Look, we're getting closer together. That's how you're one. And that's how you're happy to walk in holiness. As you walk in holiness, and you only control your own holiness. You can't control your spouses. You can pray for them. You can guide them, love them, talk, interact with the word. But in the end, you have to love them and be humble. But in the end, you end up under that head where you belong. It's a threefold cord. Ecclesiastes 4, right? Two are better than one because they have good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that's alone when he falls, for he has not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? If one prevail against them, two shall withstand them. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Bind yourself with Christ. Become his bondservant. And if you're both his bondservant, you will be united in service to him. And that will bless your marriage. I don't guarantee it. He guarantees it. Colossians. You know, if both husbands and wives would focus on God and his word, your hearts won't be able to help but become one. They won't. And there's many lessons to be learned in this journey on the way to marriage and through marriage. But don't miss this lesson about Christ. Therefore, put on as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all these things, put on love which is the bond of perfectness. At first, Colossians 3.14 may seem like an obscure expression, but in reality, the verse is telling us that the love only comes from God, but it produces a bond between believers that can't be improved upon. In other words, there's not a stronger unifying agent than the love of God can provide. And that's true of all believers, and he does expect us to have more unity and less arguing over things that will not profit. And he also means it's true for marriage. Commitment. The pledging and engaging or entrusting oneself to another in a permanent decision or union between one man and one woman Broken only by death. Love cannot operate properly without a sacrifice. Commitment. Commitment in marriage commences before a marriage ceremony. Right? It happens at the time of your engagement. You made that commitment. In the scriptures, when you were betrothed, you had to get a bill of divorce to separate, even though you weren't married yet. Just betrothal, that's how strong that commitment is. God places a lot of emphasis on our word, just like he does with his own word. Too frequently people enter marriage on a trial basis. I'll try this out. If it doesn't work, yeah. Let's sign a prenup, right? but you're not committing to whether the storms that are gonna rise. Things aren't always happy. True love endures through the valleys and yea, even will go, grow stronger when it's tested and tried. 
when you make it through the fire. You're like steel that's tempered and stronger and ready to be wielded and used by the master. But you have to have commitment. And before commitment to each other, you got to have the commitment, each of you, to God. God the Father, through his son, Jesus Christ, who died for you. If you're willing to sacrifice yourself for your spouse, you're, in, you're living in the true image of Messiah. Women who are committed to lift up and honor their husbands, whether they deserve it or not, isn't the question. Then they bring Christ honor. A soft answer turns away wrath. A gentle spirit is an ornament of great price. Commitments like the comparison of a breakfast of scrambled chicken eggs and turkey bacon, right? The chicken was involved in the breakfast, but the turkey was committed. The turkey sacrificed himself for your breakfast. You need to sacrifice in a marriage. But don't sacrifice holiness. The assurance of your companion's loyalty and endurance throughout all circumstances is the blessing you receive when you're obedient to the word. And another commitment would be, or C word I would add, is contentment. It's not on the on the diagram, but we're told in First Timothy six six that you know, godliness with contentment is great gain, and that's that can apply to a marriage or any relationship. A covenant vow is made in a marriage that promises love through better, worse, sickness, health, rich or poor, till death do us part. Why? Because that's what the scripture tells us to do. By choosing contentment in all circumstances, it doesn't mean you like it, right? But there's going to be times, there's valleys in your life. There is. Ask anyone who's married in this room, they've always just been happy. No, there's valleys, but you go through them together. And where one can't make it, the other helps the other one along. Both with the faith that they're heading towards the kingdom. A firm foundation can't be shaken by the winds of life. Contentment will bring you peace. Paul and Silas had contentment while they were in that prison. Suffering. Beaten for the word of God even. But they counted it joy for what was before them. Just like Christ suffered what he suffered and counted it joy before him. It wasn't joyful to go through it. Father, and if there's any other way, take this cup from me. But not my will, your will be done. Communication. A lack of communication, good communication. Any peaceful communication is a good communication. But lack of good communication can destroy the bond that God wants you to have. Conversation plays a vital role in coming together and becoming committed and becoming betrothed, right? You have to have that conversation to know if you're on the same path, going the same way, what you can like or learn from the other person. Right? Keep respectful communication open and vibrant, and it will be a benefit to your marriage. Don't avoid difficult conversations, but pray about them and have them in holiness. Again, not walking in the flesh, not acting out of the flesh or hurt, but walking in the spirit, trying to be pleasing to God. Communicate with your creator on a daily basis. If you're not doing it, do it. And so after you communicate with your creator, then, then conversate with each other or your spouse. Colossians 3.15 continues, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. God wants you to be at peace in your relationships. in your marriages, despite the difficulties that come your way. He says in this life, you're gonna have tribulations. So go into it knowing that. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which you are also called into one body and be you thankful. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. Be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things. For this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Oh, and you're all children of God here too. So obey your parents. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. We're to lead them to the kingdom, right? Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you'll receive the reward of your inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he that is doing wrong shall receive for the wrong that he's done. And there is no respecter of persons. We can look at God's commands, a lot of them which we read today together, in a negative fashion. Ooh, thou shalt not. I can't do that. Or we can look at them in the positive light as God's promises. Hey, you know what? If you follow me, you will not commit adultery. Yeah. Why? Because you're walking in the spirit, not after the flesh. Now, that's a promise you can bank on. Because my spirit's within you. Yeah, you could do it. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Do you know that? Right now, I'm not saying you can jump over a tall building, although I do believe if you had the faith to do so for his glory. You, you would do that too. But that's not the point of that, that verse. Seek to bring God glory. Do You can do all things because the spirit of him is abiding in you. When he died, he told his disciples, look, wait for the helper to come. Right? I won't leave you orphans. I will come to you. And there's so many verses in here about you being in Christ and Christ being in you. That's how you could do it. It's impossible for other people. I've seen... I've seen God, ungodly people, you know, just people of the world, good people, so to speak, if you can go that way, that have had wonderful marriages. But the, you know what? They did it because they kept themselves under subjection and they had communication, they had contentment, and they had commitment. They were lacking Christ. And, you know, in the end, God's going to judge them by their works. But don't let that be us. We know better. Give Christ the preeminence in your marriage, everyone. He is first, and he sees and hears everything. Every, every intent and beat of your heart, every thought, that's why we're told to bring them all into subjection to him. It won't, it's not saying you won't have a wrong thought. Lots of times that's, not, that's the voice of the enemy. Lots of times it's the voice of your heart. But you are told you have the power through the Spirit to bring that into subjection. We're meek, not weak. Galatians 5.16, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What? That sounds like a promise from God. If I walk in his spirit with the spirit in me, leading me, I won't fulfill the desires of the flesh, which are against him. That's a promise. You can do all things through him. If you follow 1 Thessalonians 5.19, right? Quench not the spirit. And if you're not familiar with that spirit voice talking to you, either you haven't gotten that point in your relationship with Christ yet or with God the Father, and you can only get with God the Father through the Son, you will. And if you've fallen away from hearing his voice and you don't remember or you're mixing your voice with his voice. You're not, you're not God. Right? Follow the rule book. Seek him. 
ask him to lead you with the spirit and then submit to that vow. You already made that vow if you're in Christ. If you've been baptized and you're his, right? And I want to, to close up with just a couple of thoughts on being able to walk in the spirit. And the first one is he not only commands it, but he empowers you to the ability to do it. Here's my law. Walk in it. Oh, yeah? You can't do it because your flesh. Here, here's my spirit. Now you got no excuse. Walk in the flesh or walk in the spirit, not the flesh. You can beat the flesh every time if you're in submission. Guaranteed. It's a promise. We don't have that excuse. Now, if we fall in sin, do we have an advocate? Jesus Christ the righteous? Yes, we do. But if you play that as a monopoly get out of jail free card, you're missing it. You're missing the point and don't think he's going to be fooled by your fake allegiance to him. And your not lack of your lack of commitment, your, your lack of faithfulness to him. And the other thing is to walk in his spirit, you have to love God. But if you don't love one another, you don't really love him, no matter how much you say up and down you do. And that's very true in a marriage, which is the image of Christ in the church. But it's also true of all of you, brethren. And guess what? It's not okay to make fun of the pagan either, because you're supposed to love them too. Is that how you're going to lead them and show them how Christ is? Did Christ do that? Well, he flipped over tables mm, to the holy right. But he didn't belittle and hurt people. Who were the snakes and vipers? Well, they were the ones that were leading other people astray with their behavior, their hypocrisy, claiming to walk in godliness, but not walking in godliness. Don't make that mistake. We have to walk in godliness. And he's empowered us to do so with the spirit. Praise him for all he's done for us. For the Father sending a son in likeness of, of human flesh, of a man who humbled himself before us. He didn't have to. He can call down 12 legions of angels at any time to wipe out iniquity. But he was merciful and loving and patient. And he set an example for us that I don't believe any single church, let alone, I mean, there's individuals everywhere that shine the holiness of God. And I want each one of us to be that same light. And your marriages need to be that light too. Again, don't be discouraged and fall away if it's not so today. He is quick to forgive. He's slow to anger. And when he forgives, it's completely gone. You may have to work on that with your spouse if you've wronged them. And that's going to take some, some time, any time he gives you. But if you stay in subjection, it'll work out. So I'll leave you with that. And I'll say thanks for listening. I hope that some of this was of edification to you. And let's have a great rest of the Sabbath together and enjoy fellowship with one another. Brother Brian?